Good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone here, and I'd like to uh, personally welcome uh, President Alexander, his staff, uh, members of the Board of Supervisor, uh, Supervisors, uh, Congressman uh, Jim McCrary and Ms. Valencia Sharpie-Jones uh, that are here today, elected, respected elected officials uh, from the Northern Delegation, thank you for being here today. Uh, foundation board members, uh, community leaders, media, and of course, our uh, important uh, LSU health employees and, and students that are here today. Today's a great day on our campus as we learn about the future plans by our LSU system to strengthen its impact on our state and our nation. I'd like to publicly thank President Alexander for delivering this message in person and for his continued strong support of our campus in North Louisiana. I also want to thank each of our, uh, each and every one of our employees and students for making me and our community so very proud. You continue to successfully compete at the local, state, and national level with your testing scores, awards, research grants, and in the delivery of cutting edge and exemplary patient care. I'd like to highlight just a few accomplishments and facts that will have a significant impact on our institution in the, in the days to come. An agreement between uh, the Texas Institute of Rehabilitation and Research, or the TIRR, Memorial Hermann Rehabilitation Center in Houston, with our neuro rehabilitation program at the outpatient uh, faculty clinic at the School of Allied Health. This agreement will bring new patients and prestige to our institution as TIRR is the number two adult rehab center in the nation. We are their first affiliate, by the way, which is a significant tribute to our faculty who have gained the trust and respect of tier leadership. Moving forward, any patient living within 100 miles of Shreveport will be referred to us from tier. This new agreement will impact patients in our recently approved Center for Brain Health. So I, and, and as well as our entire leadership team, are very excited about that. Thank you. And congratulations to, to, uh, to, to Dean McCullough. I see you back there, Dean, and uh, the entire Allied Health School. Becoming the beneficiary of the former Christus uh, Shumpert property, having access to this 18-acre property is opening up exciting patient educational research and revenue opportunities. This morning, so far, I've spent about four or five hours so far uh, meeting at a very high strategic planning level with the leadership team as well uh, as well as uh, key leadership, the entire leadership of the Ochsner system. And uh, this uh, Christus property is going to become integral to a lot of the plans that we have moving forward. So, so I thank you for that support. Receipt of a $10.5 million COBRE grant, which uh, again brings research prestige and critical income to our campus all while providing opportunities to hire and mentor junior faculty. So this is very, very important. A letter of intent with the Ochsner Health System to become our new hospital partner. While there are still many details and hurdles to work out before this agreement becomes official, I am very optimistic and, and as well as enthusiastic that we are on the brink of partnering with a very accomplished health system. It appears that the strengths and weaknesses of our respective organizations will complement each other creating a unique and welcomed opportunity for incredible growth. So I, as long as well as President Alexander, are very excited about this um, partnership. While we continue to face challenges such as this uh, state budget, I don't have to repeat that, we talked about that several times in the past couple of weeks, I ask that each of us keep calm and carry on. The important work uh, we've been hired to do, I sincerely believe that our best days lie ahead. And here to share the strategic vision for LSU is our leader, President F. King Alexander. President Alexander. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Golly, And thank you all for coming out today. And for those that were over at LSUS this morning, I apologize if some of this sounds a little repetitive. But as Senator Peacock said, he's here to make sure that I'm I'm not contradicting myself, and I'm being honest and with our statements as we go forward. Um, for 10 years, we've been, you've been reading about the budget battles that we've been fighting. Um, and 
we always say this year's worse than last year, the year before was worse than the other year. I, I'd just like to start by saying that the Land Grant Act, of which LSU and you're a part of, the Land Grant Mission, of which we are a Land Grant, Sea Grant, Space Grant University, the Land Grant Act was founded right between the battles of Shiloh and Gettysburg, with Robert E. Lee encircling Washington, D.C. Perhaps the best decision in public higher education in the world was formulated in the middle of the Civil War. Less than a month later, the National Academies of Science were, were created, a month before the Battle of Gettysburg. So my point is, everything that we're dealing with, the budget battles that we're dealing with, whether they're state or federal, they're about choices. They're about choices we make as a society, choices we make as a community, choices we make as government officials, and choices that we make at the state and federal level. You would continue to read about the state budget challenge that we have, roughly about a billion dollars that rolls off the books June 30th. But also, the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act is underway, which is once every 10 years, reauthorizing the direct student aid system, reauthorizing almost $175 billion that goes towards higher education nationally. So these are, these are choices that we're making as we go forward. For the past eight years, we've been on defense. We've had to play defense. And I've told people that at LSU, we're a little tired of being playing free safety. And now we want to do something with the ball. We've had to fight the budget battles to save our budget publicly. And, but we've also been involved in some deep strategic planning as a university, as well as some deep forward thinking in terms of it moving towards a capital campaign of which this medical school is a part of of which all of our LSU institutions are a part of. I'm here today to tell you that we're no longer going to sit quietly and we're going to sit on the sidelines. We're moving forward. We have a responsibility to better this state, our region, our nation by improving the lives of our fellow citizens and to generate research and scholarship that advances the well-being of all societies. Three letters bond us together, no matter which campus we're on throughout the state. You're part of something very exceptional in being a part of the LSU family. Your passion has both purpose and impact. Our state and our nation, they not only need us, they need you. Your talent, your vision, your scholarship, your research to solve the grandest challenges facing our society. These are not simple problems to address. And the solutions will not happen overnight. And some of those solutions may be intergenerational as you train the next generation of teachers medical professionals, and researchers. So we're accepting this challenge to better our society and to better, better this region. In six critical areas we've identified. First, advancing arts and culture, which is unique to Louisiana. This is LSU's mission. This is all of LSU's mission. And it's not just about the history of the arts or tourism. But tourism creates nearly $7 billion in economic impact to Louisiana and generates over 220,000 jobs each year. The annual impact of the arts just here in northwest Louisiana is estimated to be $90 million a year. Our faculty who publish books, they have other scholarly works, we train these artists. We train these people that populate this society. So we accept this challenge on behalf of the arts and culture. The second area is bridging the coast and environment and energy. We're challenged every day to find energy solutions that do not sacrifice our existing industry, but also do not destroy our coast and fragile surrounding environments. We're losing a football field an hour. LSU research workers uh, have actually generated nearly $5 billion in production associated with coastal erosion. Our river model, the nation's largest river, working river model that we cut the ribbon on last week, is the largest model of the Mississippi River and will allow us to better use valuable silt to create land, not lose land, as we go forward. LSU researchers in this area have also developed and enhanced, and enhanced oil recovery methods that have helped to extract more than 450 billion barrels of oil currently trapped in U.S. oil fields. And we accept this as our challenge. We live in the greatest laboratory of, of lost coastal land in the world. 
We'll be working with researchers from the Netherlands and Indonesia right in Baton Rouge at this new River Research Center. Perhaps our biggest mission, fostering research and economic and de development for the state. We're constantly challenged, the third area, we are constantly challenged to find new and innovative ways to foster research and economic development to reinvigorate our economy. And today I'm excited to share with you some brand new data for which is fresh off the presses last Friday. Five years ago, LSU, it was determined in our economic impact study in 2013, LSU brings more, brought more than $3.9 billion to the Louisiana economy. This recent e economic impact study that breaks it down, breaks LSU's impact right down to the various parishes, brings in more than $5.1 billion in economic impact across the state. That's just, and that's, this Health Sciences Center, is responsible for nearly 600 million of, that res of those economic impact resources. 600 million generated by this medical school. Another 100 million generated by LSUS. 700 million dollars LSU brings to this community. All told, the North, the North Louisiana region receives over 1.6 billion dollars in economic impact because of the work that you do as faculty and staff and the work that our students do. LSU's de even developing the LIFT Fund, st which start are starter grants to facilitate taking lab research to the marketplace, is now coming to fruition with 38 different types of projects that we hope will someday produce exceptional resources back to our institutions. This is the area that I think you impact the most in part of LSU, improving the health and well-being of this region and our, our population. One in six Louisianans have diabetes. Our state ranks fifth in the nation in terms of Alzheimer's related deaths. United Health ranking ranks us 49th in the United States in all of health. Women's health, we rank 49th. Infectious disease, we rank 50th. Cancer, we rank 46th. Cardiovascular deaths, we rank 46th. Right here in Shreveport, more than 1,300 LSU trained physicians are treating your family members and neighbors each and every day. But for us to succeed as a university, we must lift Louisiana out of being 49th in everything. 49th in these health-related areas. That should be our mission. That's not the mission of any other university in this state, but it is our mission to help us get from 49th to 46th or 45th, and then turn it over to the next generation of physicians who are in your classrooms and laboratories today so they can get us from 46th, 45th to 40th, 39th, and on and on. The fifth challenge that we face is transforming education. Most people say LSU has 45,000 students. We do, collectively. But those are the students in higher education. We have another 200,000 students that are in our 4-H programs, I call pre-college students, that we must get them college ready so that they can take the opportunity to go to college and take advantage of, so they can make that choice, not somebody else. I remember when Senator Santorum was running for president of the United States, they asked him, they said, does everybody need to go to college? And he said, no, not everybody needs to go to college. They asked him, then what are your seven children going to do? He said, well, they're all going to go. It's always somebody else's child that doesn't need to go to college. Whether they go or not, we must give them the option and give them the skills so they can succeed. In educational attainment, we rank 49th in the country. Another area we must set our sights on and improving. Another area that we must go after. The reason why? Because this year, this is another reason why we have to be on offense. This year, we have the largest applicant pool in LSU's history. We are 32% up on applications wanting to go to college. And you're reading about the TOPS discussion, and yes, that does impact us. And that's why we need this legislative budget solved and solved in February. So those families and students are not held hostage till the end of June. And opt to go somewhere else, opt to take their talent, their human capital to another state to build their economy. Our African-American enrollment, we are up 80% on top of the largest African-American enrollment we've ever had and the largest African-American graduating class that we've ever had. Our Hispanic enrollment, up 
Our underrepresented student populations have never seen numbers such as these. And for this state to succeed, we must succeed in educating and helping our underrepresented populations complete college. The reason why, we're all in the social mobility business. And this day and age, you read a lot about social mobility not being a part of the American fabric. And that is being measured in many different ways, but that is indeed true in many areas where many European countries have become more socially mobile than us. But I'm pleased to say LSU's social mobility, as measured by the Cheeky Study, is still alive and well and vibrant. Our social mobility ranks us fifth among 14 SEC schools in getting students from a lower quartile to the next quartile in income. Or getting a family from the second quartile to the third, from the third to the fourth. Now Vanderbilt gets its students from the fifth quartile, and they end up in the fifth quartile. That's what the study shows. I would argue, what have they done? What have they actually accomplished? As long as we're helping students, one generation, get to the next quartile, and the next quartile. That matters, and that's what we do. We're in the social mobility business. Finally, we develop leaders. We develop leaders. And the development of our leaders can be measured whether they are working from Nike to Nissan, from Pandora to Pixar, from Google to Gerber, Mayo Clinic to Mount Sinai. That's where our graduates are. I'm pleased to say the graduates of LSU, of 50 flagship universities in the United States, our graduates actually rank 21st in the nation among 50 flagship universities in starting salaries. And that's tied with Chapel Hill and tied with Ohio State. Now our mid-career earners actually rank 18th in the United States. That's above Ohio State. That's above Chapel Hill. These are all our challenges. And the biggest challenge facing us today, you find in your classroom, you'll find them in your offices, and you find them in your laboratories, is that we, we're the product the baby boomers are the product of being the most educated generation that we've ever had. Our 55 to 64 year olds in this country rank number one in the world in percentage with college degrees. Number one in the world. Unfortunately, our 25 to 34 year olds now rank 13th. This is our challenge. This is everybody's challenge. And Louisiana ranks 49th on that chart. We must stop many of the things that we've been doing and make better decisions. We incarcerate more people than anybody on earth per capita, certainly in the United States, but in states that, countries that we've measured. We'd much rather educate than incarcerate. And these challenges are LSU's challenges, whether it's health, well-being, coastal erosion, agricultural production, all of these areas. K through 12 education. One of the big challenges in K through 12 education is that everybody's pointing fingers at everybody. Higher education blames the high schools. The high schools blame the middle schools. Middle schools blame the elementary schools. We need to stop passing the blame around because the people in those classrooms are our graduates. The people running those schools are our graduates. The children in those classrooms are our kids and need our help to open the door to higher education access. And we, what they're talking about tomorrow in the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act is indeed about access. But today, it's about success. The student that ends up in the greatest student loan debt in the United States that defaults more than any other student is one that started college and didn't finish. One that accrued the debt and at the same time did not benefit from any of the completion or the salaries that are generated by holding a college diploma. We must help our students be college ready, get access to colleges and universities, but also help them finish what they start. And if we don't take them along on this journey, who will do the research in the next generation? Who will do the teaching in the next generation? This is LSU's mission. And I'm proud to say we're still about social mobility in a country where this has been questioned over and over again. And in 1998, it was even stated, and they asked the economists, does Horatio Alger exist in America today? 
The economist said in 1998, Horatio exists, but he has to go to college first. I would argue that Horatio has to finish college now, in this day and age. So these are our challenges. How can LSU play a role in getting us from 49th to 47th to 46th? What is our responsibility as, as the flagship university? We're the only one that can do it. We're the only university in this state that generates over $500 million in federal research and research-related funding that generally is tied to addressing these very issues. So this is a challenge for us. It's a challenge for faculty and staff. Sure, the budgets, we're going to be in the budget battles like we always are. But more importantly, let's, let's move this train forward. Let's get Louisiana out of being stuck at the bottom of so many things when our application pools look so great. And there's so much hope and optimism in the next generation of college graduates and students. We're the only one in this state that can do this collectively. And I'm going around the state this week challenging our faculty and staff in every corner to play a role and measure our success by how well the state is improving in all these areas, in these important social and economic areas. That's the job of a land grant, sea grant, space grant university, of which there are only 17 in the United States. There, we're only le there's less than half a percent of the 4,300 institutions of higher education that can claim to be a land grant, C grant, space grant institution. So these are all of our challenges. These are the challenges that we will make clear to our state legislators. These are the challenges we make clear to our federal legislators. And these are the challenges that we need their help in helping us solve these problems. These problems will be solved by you, the talent that you bring to the table the human capital that LSU has that nobody else in this state can collectively say the same thing. So I appreciate all of you, the work that you do each and every day. We want this medical school to grow, expand, and serve the region and tackle these very issues that I mentioned in health and well-being. Right now, there's a group meeting upstairs. It's our healthcare professionals, our administrators, as well as Oshner's top team. We want as many partners as possible to solve these problems and to attack these problems head on. The only way these will get solved is if LSU plays an active role in reaching out and solving these with our three tools, teaching, research, and service. So I'm here to thank you for what you do, but also to challenge you to tackle all of these issues because nobody else can do it. Nobody else is equipped to change what we see in Louisiana, whether it's incarceration, health care, education, all the above. So thank you all for coming, and I look forward to taking any of your questions as we go forward. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, President Alexander that very uh, invigorating and inspirational uh, discussion. Um, I, I can tell you, I, I can remember w one of the first times uh, I met President Alexander, uh, he told me, he said, you know, as, the, as, as does the state, LSU follows, and as does LSU, the state follows. I think we're sort of connected at the hip. And uh, I don't know how you exactly said it, but it, sort of paraphrasing it, it's just, uh, it's, you know, the state and, and LSU are really inseparable, and uh, they're sort of kind of connected at the hip or connected at the heart, I guess, is probably more appropriate. Uh, any questions uh, from the audience? Uh, yes, Terry, Dr. Davis. Well, President Alexander, thanks for coming up here. Um, I'm Terry Davis, professor of medicine and pediatrics. Um, I think many people in our community, our community, They're concerned that the focus is that a and campus. Can you say a little more about how you see our role in your strategic plan? Certainly. We're not moving any med schools. I, every time I'm up here, I do have that, that question pops up. We, we want this medical school to thrive and succeed and even grow. And that's what the meeting was upstairs going on right now. Austin wants the same thing. Other partners <laughs> want to see the same thing. We want to see this. Med school grow and thrive. 
We also want to know how we can collectively on the A&M campus, along with the medical schools, both medical schools and Pennington, tap into more federal research opportunities, cancer designation, other, other federal research opportunities that are requiring one major partner or collective partners. So what we haven't done as well as we should is that we, we've been a little more detached than we need to be. And I think collectively by working together with the talent that we have on the main campus, the talent that we have here, Pennington with the new director that we brought in, Dr. Kerwin from the Cleveland Clinic, we're going to see a lot more opportunities. We're going to see a lot more opportunities to collectively tackle these problems and generate federal research dollars that we, we all can work on. We got an abundance of problems. And that's the only way we're, I can see us tackling. Um, so we want, we want this medical school to thrive and succeed and grow and expand. And today, I can tell you today, we were talking about the possibility of expansion. How many? I think Dr. Golly told me about that this morning. We're already talking about the possibility of expansion. So once we get the state budget resolved, which we really need to get that resolved in February, not dragging this out till June because there is a human capital toll on us. They'll go to other states. We knew, know that from last year. But you also won't be able to recruit anybody if their budget hole goes all the way to June. Those are both students and faculty members. So we need stability, budget stability as we go forward. And we need to work together more often, more frequently. And let's get our share of the federal research dollars so that we can solve the problems. We've got the best laboratory. We've got other universities coming to Louisiana to study us. Let's do it better and do it better together. And all, along those same lines, uh, Dr. Davis, just, just today in <clears throat> high-level meetings with the, the Oshner uh, president and CEO, uh, one of the things that, that he suggested, and we had even talked about, was actually having our campus, our LSU Health Science Center in Shreveport, run the research for the entire enterprise of Oshner Health System. That's huge, man. I mean, that could be, you know, tens of millions of dollars uh, to support our campus. They recognize our LSU's expertise in research, and they don't want to reinvent the wheel. They're, they're just saying, hey, what do you think, Chris? What if we have you guys run the whole research enterprise for the entire Oshner Health System? That would be, that would be huge for LSU. And running back to the choice, just the choice part, I want to, because these are all choices that we're making in the legislature, choices that we're making. Um, I'm a seventh generation Kentuckian. We're, Kentucky's 48th and everything. <laughs> but I can say this, Kentucky doesn't have one-fifth the re natural resources that we do. Kentucky, I mean, Kentucky doesn't have, it had two industries, coal and tobacco. Bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget that, Mr. President. Yeah. And, <laughs> And, and tobacco is still a vegetable there. Uh, uh, we've got more natural resources and talent than Kentucky does. Much more diverse populations, mu much more diverse industries. We need to make the right choices and make better choices as we go forward. And that's why I really see this boils down to, we talk about bad budget here, bad budget this. It's choices. Choices on what we fund, choices on what we do with it, and choices on how we solve these problems. So I thought I'd share that Kentucky, since I've spent a lot of time studying both states. Yes, yes sir. sir. First of all, I'd like to echo thanks for coming. Uh, we'd like to see you tomorrow. Uh, so please come up and visit. The, the issue that I think everyone has is is what you articulated, we need, we need financial stability. And yes, we're going to have, you know, best case scenario, we get a state budget in February, and then we start it all over again. How do we get smooth stability? How do we get out of this, this yearly cycle of a fiscal cliff? I think, <laughs> I kind of want to look over 
here to Senator Peacock. <laughs> <laughs> that indeed is the question. I mean, I think we've, uh, for the last decade, we've thrown about every gimmick uh, that we possibly could. Um, you know, there's, they're, they're going to have to talk about the future possibility of a uh, constitutional session and what we need to do to have complete stability. Uh, but I know our governor wants to, really wants to support higher education and protected our budget last year, and our, our Senate certainly did, and, and our House came to the realization that you can't just fund tops and then cut higher education to the bone because the tops to nowhere doesn't get you anywhere. And now there's a new realization that higher education, we have taken the larger cuts than any other state in the last decade. And this stability has to occur this year, and we need new revenues to start building back. The nation has recovered from the recession, and public higher education funding nationwide the last two years has gone up 3.4% and 1.6%. That's nationwide. We just didn't get cut. We're not, it's not increasing. We're serving more students. And in fact, as I said in my last hearing going, going out of the legislative session, I thank the legislature for not cutting us last year, but we were, our funding level, I thank them for keeping us at our 1991 funding level. And we have about, just at LSU, about 7,000 more students than we had in 1991. But we're at 1991 funding level. And if you take a look at the tax effort, which is the tax capacity of what, based on per capita income, we're at 1990, 1964 funding level for higher education. So I want to see the federal government put some money on the table to save public higher education, to keep states from disinvesting in this fashion, and to put matching funds on the table so many of our state officials actually get, get further support by protecting our budget and giving us stability. And that can be a state and federal level. The Land Grant Act was a state-federal partnership. Federal government said, we'll give you this territorial land you do what you want with it, but you have to build a university that addresses the needs of the day. And the needs of the day were building roads and bridges, feeding armies and growing populations, and building military leaders to fight in future fights. That was the needs, those were the needs of that day. The things that I talked about are the needs of this day. And are we going to be that new land-grant university or return to the land-grant university that we were founded on those principles to address. So yes, we want stability. We believe the sooner we can get stability, the faster we can move in tackling these issues. So I think that the gimmicks are gone. I think that we've seen about, uh, if you remember the Great Save Act, uh, that, was, that, was, that, was, that, that was quite a show, that, the Save Act, where you money over here and take it from over here. But we need stability, and we have legislators. They're here with us today. They wouldn't be here if they didn't care about this institution. They didn't care about funding the next generation of students. But a constitutional convention sounds pretty nice. Yes, ma'am. I have concerns about two things that I heard you address. You talked about the students who start college and don't finish. But what about the students who do? Those students who go and get bachelor's degrees and can't find a job, and now they, they have that debt. Then they turn around and go and get a master's degree, thinking it's going to give them a more competitive edge, and that doesn't, and end up taking a job where they didn't have to go to college at all. That's one of the problems that I see with education here in Louisiana. Most of our kids, and I can use my own three children, none of my children are here because, and there are some of them are just right over in Texas, but they are getting jobs, and we are losing a lot of our brain drain. That's, that's one problem. You, may, you mentioned the incarceration of you know, letting people out of Angola, because we've all read about that, and that's a concern in my community, because if those people who are let out of Angola have no training and no skills, how are they going to survive? They're going to go back into an element of and it's going to be a revolving door where they can leave the community and go back to Angola. Let me check the last one first. Um, I'm talking about making sure less and less students get incarcerated uh, at a, 
and they have options as they get as they grow up. But college is key and cr critical to that. Senator Peacock mentioned the same thing. We've got a lot of graduates in Houston. Um, many of our institutions do an outstanding job. There's two ways to look at that. We do an outstanding job educating our students. The problem is we're not the only ones that want to keep them. Other people want to steal them. Other people want to steal our seniors in high school that have 30 and above ACTs. They're throwing dollars at them left and right. The students, the, the ones who are in the greatest jeopardy, the students who are in the greatest jeopardy are the students that go to the for-profit sector universities which are low-income, underrepresented populations. These, the for-profit sector has 11% of the students, 30% of all Pell Grants, and 47% of all student loan defaults. We need to make sure parents and students are making the right choices on which colleges to go to. We fought for eight years and got in place the college scorecard so every university has to tell parents and students what happens to the graduates. How many of them are paying back student default? How many have default rates? What are their starting salaries? The fact that we are forcing institutions to cough up their data, outcomes-based data, is a good thing. Because there are a lot of universities, just like you mentioned, that charge $75,000 a year, and all they can do is brag about how many kids they send to grad school. We're trying to expose these institutions and show that only 38%, I know not med school, but only 38% of the undergraduates at LSU graduate with any debt whatsoever. The national average is 80%. And that 38% has half the debt. We want them no debt, and we want great jobs and incomes for them. Now, we must work with our legislators to make sure those jobs are here in Louisiana. And we must work with our legislators to make sure that they don't go to Alabama or Arkansas, because I know there's a lot of money being thrown at your top talented students right now. And we lose them. That's Arkansas's gain. They pick up the social and economic rate of return for a lifetime. That earnings that you hear about, a college graduate will earn over a million dollars more than a high school graduate who didn't go to college. Well, some of the state's going to be receiving the benefit of that million dollars. So we have to keep them. We need to work with our industries so that we can keep, and we have to get them prepared so they don't need to be incarcerated. Education is the best way to keep people out, because with education comes better career options, better lifelong decisions, less poverty, better health care. Just about every variable that we measure can be measured by having higher levels of educational attainment. We, we actually have, well, the, our two-year sector, our community colleges, um, focus both on trade, vocational education, and I do note their enrollments are growing. But I will say that this state, unlike many others, never built a, su a sufficient infrastructure in the two-year sector until recently, I'd say in the last five to ten years. Because many students in the best states that have done that, Florida, Illinois, California, New York, actually have big, vibrant two-year sector institutions. So trade schools, yes, they're good jobs there. But I also want them to have other options. And we need to have two- and four-year options for them, and grad school options. That's the way that, that that's how, those are the choices we need to provide for them. Well, yes, sir. Um, just in addition to uh, this question, um, is it possible to maybe propose uh, of development of social optimism program. And the idea behind that program would be that our graduates from LSU would be guaranteed first work position, work place. In other words, when they're graduating, we will prepare them for this program to guarantee them the spot in Louisiana and uh, the regional, the regional needs. Uh, they will get that work position and job position um, uh, within our uh, state. I, I, I would say one of the best advantages that we have on sort of a grow your own are our med schools. Um, our med schools have a very, very small percentage of out-of-state coming to us, and we have a very, very high percentage of our graduates staying in the state, whether it's dentistry, applied health, everything that we're doing. And in fact, the med, this med school 
does an outstanding job to the extent that this question gets asked about every legislative session, how many are staying in the state? Well, our med schools are great examples of how we've grown our own, taken our own from the inside, grown our own, hired our own. And it's a great model for what could happen, could happen to so many other fields of study. Engineering. Yes, we have a lot of engineers that work in Houston, but we also have thousands and thousands of engineers working right here in, in Shreveport or in, or in New Orleans. And if those opportunities are present, then we want them to stay. They want to stay. But the med school is perhaps one of our best examples of how we have grown, successfully grown our own, and, and kept them here as, as they've gone forward. That's right. You know, our, our, we, we're keeping now upwards of 60% in state here. Uh, and, you know, that's why it's so very, very important from a, from a budget standpoint to uh, try to do the best we can to avoid the negative publicity of, of sort of, you know, the budget cuts that we have at the state level because that is the main factor nowadays deterring students from wanting to stay here. And, you know, once they, the students leave, first of all, getting them here, and then once they stay, if we can get them here and keep them here to train in, in Louisiana, then they're more likely to stay here. But, uh, uh, you know, if, if there's bad publicity about uh, whether the school's going to close or not or move or not, and, and of course, there, there, there's no interest in moving the school anywhere, um, certainly not from the system's office, not from the, pre, uh, not from the, uh, the governor's office, for sure. Uh, so those are the kind of things that we're trying to avoid. But we're very, as the president says, we've been very successful at, at keeping, keeping our own graduates here uh, within the state. And I will tell you that once we open the medical school class up to just a minimum of 10% of out of state, our, I think Dr. Platt, Dr. Kennedy, I don't know if he's in here, uh, will tell you that uh, our more than double the number of applications to our medical school class this past year. I mean, uh, more than maybe two and a quarter increase uh, in, in the number of applications because we opened it up to, to out of state. And getting people to come from out of state and move here is another way to improve our economy. And believe me, two medical schools is plenty. Uh, the, the proportion of headaches I get from my medical schools are disproportionately <laughs> high. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Arnold is our past uh, president of the faculty senate there. You want to, you want you have a question? I certainly would, I, first of all, get your voices out there. Let your voices be heard. Um, our legislators do respond when they hear an outcry on various issues. I think we've got a lot of sympathy on behalf of our legislators because of what's happened over the last eight to 10 years. Now, that may not be seen in the national circles, but certainly for us. Uh, and the work that we're doing, we've never been more efficient. We're, the autonomies we've acquired in procurement and risk management, the things that we've been able to save um, are, are quite extraordinary in what we've done. We've got legislators who see that happen. Uh, there are those that think that, that higher education should be privatized. Um, I only know of a handful of universities that can legitimately privatize. And there are other public universities that have become less public. By that, I mean they enroll 90% out-of-state students and don't even serve their in-state populations. Michigan, University of Colorado. You, know, you go into the University of Colorado bookstore and you see a sweatshirt that says the University of California at Boulder. Oregon, Arizona, many, many states. Alabama's 70% out-of-state. And we talk a lot about football. And I know this is a yearly, yearly transition on the football field. But I'm pleased to say that of the 14, the 14 SEC institutions in, in, in the Southeastern Conference, that our lifelong scoreboard looks a little better than theirs. I mean, our starting salaries rank fourth. Alabama's ranks 11th. And a lot of it has to do with STEM, science, engineering. 
Alabama doesn't have what Auburn has. Al Auburn has the STEM in Alabama. We do it all here. We even have Arkansas's veterinary medicine program where we have to hold out slots for the kids from Arkansas, mm -hmm. the students from Arkansas. Dental school too. Dental school. We're the only dental school in the state. Uh, so all of these, these are assets that we need to capitalize on by working together. Yes, sir. To point out, you brought up football. It's a, it's a reasonably uh, timely uh, point. But I think to our legislators, recognize the fiscal responsibility of LSU. It's one of the very few premier universities and programs, sports programs in the country that has a firewall between the football team and the university. And the money goes solely, as I understand it, from the football team to the university and not the other way. If the coach gets a million dollar salary, that's because he's made it on tickets and t-shirts and whatever else. And our fiscal responsibility in our sports has been something that we need to champion. Well, I, I'll point out that we just had a negotiation, and uh, so we're working on a new contract. But our athletic program just gave the handed over eight million dollars in net revenues to the university for university operating expenses. Uh, in previous years, it's been ten, ten-ish, depending on uh, depending on the year and on the net revenues. Um, and our athletic program does; it's self-sufficient. It doesn't even have student fees in it, which there may be a dozen schools in the United States. That, that, that are self-sufficient. Now, do we have a problem with athletic spending? Absolutely, absolutely. And I remember when I was in the Big 10, this issue came up in 1998, and we couldn't even put the brakes on it in the Big 10 when James Duderstadt from Michigan told us to all collectively do something about that. Collectively, we were in, we were in Washington, D.C. during the tax reform discussions in December, trying to save our grad students from having to count tuition waivers as taxable income. And we were working on a number of issues when the Texas A&M salary hit. $75 million for Jimbo Fisher for 10 years. They about laughed us out of the room. We were able to save the grad student, but we lost a couple other issues, such as tradition deductions and others. But we've got to get a handle on this, because it's already causing substantial damage in the form of paying players. And what you see, the numbers are astronomical. And this will probably have to have some kind of congressional involvement so, so that we get exempted from antitrust so we can collectively do something together. Yes, sir. I think we'll take one more question in, uh, for President Alexander. Yes, so, our, so good question about the recent reforms. As, as we dig through it, the, I think the key takeaways are student interest, uh, student interest on loans they're able to keep and deduct it. That, they were after that. Graduate tuition, it would, have, it would have devastated graduate education around the country if they had to count any of their tuition scholarship waivers as, as income. I mean, it would have probably cut grad schools in half. Um, that's a win. Where we're uncertain about is on, is on the planned gifts, on state gifts, because the threshold was raised to such a higher level that they call it the death tax, or somebody can give much, much more to their families without having to lose it to the government, of which we were able to generate millions and millions from people who said, I'd rather give it to the university than give it to the government. And that's the area that we're watching the closest. Uh, in addition to the deductibility of donations for seats at ball games, those two areas were basically losses in this fight. But the other areas, I think, are far more important for our students. And I, I was disheartened to see that our students were being thrown under the bus because that really would have wiped out graduate education nationally. And hopefully that won't come back up again. Okay. Uh, Thank you, President Alexander. Uh, a round of applause for President Alexander.